Oh, good morning. Good morning and welcome all uh, to our worship on this, the third Sunday in, in Lent. A kind of welcome too to those who aren't here physically but who join us uh, for these services on, online, both members of friends or the congregation uh, here in Bermuda, but also from other countries, other parts of the world as well. A warm welcome to all. Um, couple of notices. First of all, with the, with the arrangements that we presently uh, require uh, for worship, for coming into the church and so on, ideally we should have two people on each door um, e- each Sunday to take the temperature and just to record um, presence here. So if any others could help with ushering on a Sunday morning, that would be much appreciated. Um, and contact, contact Liz, please, in the office. And also now we're back worshiping in, in the sanctuary. If you'd like to contribute flowers for our Sunday worship, again, there's a, there's a notice outside the kitchen uh, for the providing of, of flowers for worship. And after the Sunday service, these flowers are delivered uh, to members of the congregation and others uh, who are perhaps having a difficult time. So that's one intimation. The uh, other intimation is Doug tells me, Doug tells me that the position of Minister of Christchurch Warwick will be advertised in the paper this week. Um, I had indicated when I first came here that uh, I do four years, I've now done five, and we've decided we will stay on a bit longer. I hope that's agreeable to the congregation. (laughs) But before Doug can apply for my renewed work permit, it has to be advertised apparently, uh, so that's why it'll it'll be being advertised this week. Let us worship God. Following the words of the hymn, be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Again, we're unable to, we're unable to sing, we have to keep masks on, but uh, Ron and Cindy will, will lead it. It's hymn 189. <laughs>
earth is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent in his presence. Let us pray. O God, our heavenly Father, the source from whom we come and the end to whom we travel, help us to worship with reverence and with sincerity. Quieten our restless minds, strengthen our uncertain faith, stir our sleeping consciences. We gather with your whole church in heaven and on earth to acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all life, the wonder of the furthest galaxies, this planet on which we live, the creator and sustainer too of our own individual lives. We have been given these lives with their richness of opportunity and their wealth of interest. Too often we have wasted, misused them. We complain, grumble, forgetting what others endure. We can be hard on others and generous to ourselves. And at times we'd rather wear the blinkers of prejudice than face the light of your truth. And so before you now we ask forgiveness, as we ask also the forgiveness and the patience of those whom we have wronged or hurt. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of that forgiveness that we might be freed from these faults and failings and the guilt of the past. O oh, gracious God, help us to discern your presence in our midst through the promptings of your Holy Spirit. We pray for faith, for faith in that creative love through which the world was made, for faith in the divine purposes and actions shown to us in Christ. Lord, give us faith. We pray for hope, for hope that good will triumph over evil, truth over falsehood, for hope that we will never think ourselves too strong to not require to depend on you, Lord, give us hope, and we pray for love, for that love which is patient and kind, for the love which delights in the truth, and for that love which has no limit to its faith, its hope, and its endurance. We pray for love, and these prayers we offer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The psalm for today is Psalm 19, which we will read responsively. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, Reviving the soul, the decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The decrees of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. To be desired are they than gold. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. Amen. 
Music for reflection.
Today's Gospel reading is from the Gospel of St. John, although this is the year of Mark's Gospel. For a number of weeks it departs from it and goes into John's Gospel in uh, in this period of Lent. So it's St. John chapter 2 and at verse 13, and John's account of Jesus' cleansing of the temple. Hear the word of God. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May God bless to us the reading of his word. To his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. And again, in the words of the psalmist, may the words that I speak and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In some ways, this is a curious reading to have at this period of of, of Lent, the third Sunday of Lent. We associate it more with with Holy Week and the beginning of Holy Week, because in the in the Synoptic Gospels, in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, this this event of the cleansing of the table takes place in the last week of of Jesus' life after he has arrived with his disciples uh, in Jerusalem. And in these Gospels we're told this story that he goes to the temple and he turns over the the tables of the the money changers and causes a a sort of disruption, if you you like. It's worth spending a little bit of time on Mark's account and Matthew and Luke of, of, of this event before we turn to John. Because apart from anything else, it, it shows the, the quite different purposes, if you ha- like, that they had in, in, in recording it. Because John's purpose in recording it, and he does so right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Not at the end, but right at the beginning. But John's purpose in, in, uh, in recording it see, is, quite, is quite different from the, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. In the Synoptic Gospels, he goes into the temple, and there is this ev- event he finds himself in, in, in confrontation. It's, in a sense, it's a sort of minor protest. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense um, in terms of what was going on with the absolutely normal practice of the temple and of temple, of temple worship. Perhaps as many as 100,000 Jews would travel to Jerusalem in preparation for the Passover. And on arriving there and going to the temple, they would be required to make a temple a temple offering. In fact, it was part of their, their religion, part of their faith, that they would have to give uh, two days uh, pay, if you like, two days working pay to the temple each, each year. So if you consider the amount of people who were doing that, it made the temple a very wealthy uh, institution. But in going to the temple priests to make their offering, they couldn't do it with the Roman coinage, which is the coinage of the realm. They had to, to do it using the shekel, the Jewish shekels. And so they would go to the money changers and they would change their coins from the Roman coins, their denarii, into into shekels to present to the the temple priests. So that was quite normal that they should be there. It was also very normal that they would purchase a sacrifice to again present to the temple priests. And and only, only priests could make these sacrifices. And they would purchase them there rather than bring them themselves because the the animal or the bird to be sacrificed had to be without blemish. The lamb um, or the the dove or the the pigeons. 
And if you were sufficiently wealthy or shared with others, it would be a, be a lamb or a sheep that would be purchased and sacrificed. Uh, if you were poorer and couldn't afford that, it would be a, a dove or a, or a pigeon. So again, this was quite a sort of normal practice within the temple, and yet Jesus goes in there and he disrupts it. We shouldn't see this as a full-blown riot. I mean, the temple precincts are enormous. Um, you know, quite a number of, I don't know, 20 football pitches, something like that, it's huge. And this event would have probably just taken place, place in, a, in a corner somewhere in, the, in one of the outside courts, the court of the, of the Gentiles. It would be noticed, it would be noticed because at Passover time, the whole precinct would be policed by the temple police and the Roman authorities. So they would see something going on. But this is not, this is not a massive riot. For a short space of time, it would have, it would have brought the, uh, the temple work just to a, to a short stop, if you like. And then things would have continued as normal. So in a way, it was symbolic. It was a way of interrupting the normal practice of the temple. Um, and doing so for very specific reasons. He says in Mark's gospel that you have turned it, this house of prayer into a, a place of, of robbers. Actually, it's better translation is bandits. And there may be a sense there that it was a place of sanctuary for, if you like, not so much bandits, but those that had violently opposed the Roman Empire were being looked for. And there was a place for them to hide and to be safe and to, and to find sanctuary. And it was still a house of prayer. I mean, where he would have been in the outer court, that was the court for the Gentiles, for non-Jews, who could go to this area and pray and, and learn about the, about the faith of, of Judaism. So it seems in, the, in these three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's a, it's a symbolic act which seeks to bring to a stop, even temporarily, the practices of the, of the temple and of the, and of the priesthood. And he does that because of the corruption that he sees there and the wealth of the temple and the hand and glove operating with the Jewish authorities. It's a, it's a small but significant protest in these gospels. Now in John's gospel, it's quite different. John puts it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and he uses it for a different purpose. And as we discussed it in our, in our Bible study of this passage on, on Wednesday evening, which you're invited to join uh, online, that the clue is in, in a sense in some of the words of our first hymn that we sang, be still for the presence of the Lord. This for John is about presence. It's about God's presence, the way that he tells the story of the cleansing of the temple. You have to remember that for, for Judaism, for the faith of the Jewish people, God's presence was located in Jerusalem, but not just in Jerusalem, in the temple itself. And in not just the temple, but in what was called the Holy of Holies, the sort of inner sanctuary of the, of the temple. Their opening words of the call to prayer this morning was from the prophet Habakkuk. The Lord is in his temple, let all the earth be, be silent. So God's presence was associated with being in the inner sanctuary of the temple where historically in the first temple, the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the laws given to Moses, was, was kept. So this was the holiest part um, of, of the temple. And the, the high priest was the only person that was allowed to go in there. And he was only allowed to go in once a year. And nobody else could go in. And just in case anything happened to him when he was in there, they used to tie a rope round his ankle. So that if he died when he was in there, no one could go in and get him. They just hauled him out. Right. Before another high priest could be you know, ordained, if you like, and then take, take, take his place. You couldn't have more than one person in there. So that's the key that for, for Jewish faith, for Judaism, the place of God's presence is in the Holy of Holies. And then John tells this story about the disruption. And where does John, in his whole gospel, where does John find God's presence? Not in the temple, not in the Holy of Holies, but in the person of Jesus himself. 
And that's key to the understanding of John's gospel. That for John, Jesus in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension embodies, if you like, the person of God. God himself in, inhabits that person. And so when Jesus said, destroy this temple and it will be rebuilt in three days, as they say, they're talking about his, his resurrected body. And remember, when John is writing his gospel, the last of the gospels to be written, it's probably some 30 years since the temple has been utterly destroyed and not rebuilt. But he's writing it with the faith, his faith in, in Jesus having been crucified but resurrected and ascended. So, the presence of God, not in the Holy of Holies, not in the temple, but in the person of Jesus. Where do we look or where do we experience the presence of God? In our psalm that we read today, there's a sense of seeing God's presence in the wonder of creation. And when we listened, when we listened to the hymn on, on uh, Wednesday evening being sung by the Welsh singer Alda Jones, it was accompanied by beautiful photographs of nature, of mountains, of, of rivers, uh, of lakes, the occasional, for some reason, old graveyard with crosses in it. But that was, in a sense, the presence of God found in the wonder and in the, and the glory of nature. And you may have your own places where you have sensed or sensed that. It might be walking a beach. It might just be staring out on the vastness of the ocean. It might be pondering the, the wonder of the night sky, whatever. It might be a special place or a special moment. And that's, that's understandable. And, and that's why I think these photographs were shown alongside Alla Jones singing it. But for John, there's two things. No, it, the real presence is to be found in the person of, of Jesus. And you cannot go behind his back, as it were, to discover the nature of God. You'll discover the nature of God in him and through him. And if he's present with us now through his spirit, where do we look? And what I would simply suggest is that in the singing of that hymn, be still for the presence of God. Yes, these beautiful shots of nature and wonder, but maybe also we should have had photographs of refugee camps or busy, busy accident and emergency wards, or places of suffering, um, places of conflict, Maybe these should have been there as well because that is certainly where we will still see and discover God's, God's presence. We cannot get through Easter to the resurrection and to the ascension without passing by the way of the cross. And there we find, surprisingly and challengingly, the nature of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, for all your gifts and blessings to us in life, we give you thanks. For those special moments, memories that we treasure, times of celebration and happiness, loving moments. And we give thanks too for the hopes that we have of celebrations ahead for those for whom this is a time of excitement and anticipation, new beginnings. We give thanks for your constant presence with us in good times and in bad. Above all, we give thanks for your very nature revealed to us in the person of Christ, revealed in his ministry and his life, but revealed too in his sharing of human suffering Thank you for, him, for his raising up and his presence now with us through your Holy Spirit. In his name we offer our prayers for others. We pray for our families and our friends, wherever they are. Remember in our prayers this day, members of our congregation still concerned to join in worship and rightly so because of their vulnerability but who miss the fellowship and the friendship and of seeing one another. We hold them in our prayers to you. 
We pray for those of our members and others in the community, friends who are ill at this time. For we have people in hospital, people who are ill at home, others who have grown frail and are dependent on the support and the care of others. We ask that they may know your blessing and peace. We remember too in prayers those who are anxious or troubled, those who have at this time financial and economic worries and concerns, the loss of employment, fears for the future. May they find support and friendship. And we pray always for those who have been bereaved, whether in recent weeks, months, or even years, and whom live still with that sense of loss and absence. May they be touched by the healing of your Holy Spirit. We remember too in our prayers this morning those whose lives are so very different from our own and for whom life is a daily struggle. Those who have lived for generations now as refugees with no home, no real home and no state of their own. We pray for those who have been the victims in recent years and months of civil war. And we hope and pray for a greater peace in the Middle East especially. We remember those who have suffered from acts of violence. And then there are those whose lives have been changed by natural disaster, by flood, seeing crops fail, those who struggle daily with poverty. And as we remember them, we remember too in our prayers those who are the leaders of the nations, those who govern and have power and have influence. And pray that together in community may we work for a fairer sharing of the world's resources and a greater peace and reconciliation where there is presently hatred and division. In this period of Lent, we pray for your church. A time of reflection. A time to ponder again on your being, your nature, and your ways, and all that is you ask of us. As we, in a sense, join with Jesus and the disciples in that journey to Jerusalem, reflecting on his life and his ministry, the acclaim, but also the opposition. May your church, today's body of Christ in the world, be reflective of your love and compassion. We remember too in our prayers those no longer with us, but who influenced our lives, whose love we received. May we never think them far from us, for we share a fellowship, a communion with them still, through the mystery of that fellowship and communion that we have in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We will not physically take up the offering, but there is the opportunity of an offering either as you come in or uh, as, you, as you leave. But we will offer now our prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate our offering and all our offerings of time, of talents, and of money. May they be symbols of our desire to live in your ways and to work for the growth of the signs of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You've been saying debts for 30 odd years. It's difficult to get out of the habit at times. Let's close our worship with the hymn, Christ is made the sure foundation. It's hymn 
200. Again, we'll follow the words. Let us stand for the closing benediction and then we will say together the words of go now in peace. Go in peace and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. Amen. Go now in peace. Never be afraid. God will go with you each hour of every day. Go now in faith, steadfast, strong, and true. Know he will guide you in all you do. Go now in love, show you believe. Reach out to others so all the world can see. God will be there watching from above. Go now in peace, in faith, and in love. Mm -hmm.